So my name is Nicole Smith. I am the Event and Communications Coordinator for Spark Niagara and the host for our weekly webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We are very excited uh, with our topic sub or subject, topic subject? I'm French, it happens, I'm sorry. But with the topic that's being addressed today, because of the fact that it's with regards to a lot of questions that I know I have and a lot of our entrepreneurs at Spark have had, and that's with regards to, to corporate law. And you know, when do you incorporate, when do you not, what does that whole piece look like, and so much more. And we're so excited to have Michelle Chan from Lawyers and House dot com with us. This is the second time lawyersandhouse.com uh, does a presentation for us and we are so humbled and thrilled of their willingness to share their expertise and we're very, very excited to have you, Michelle, do this as we understand this is uh, something that you specialize in and so we are looking forward to hearing from you. As I said, uh, we've had a few people join so uh, just a reminder, please remain on mute for the duration of the presentation. You will have the opportunity to ask your questions and you will be able to unmute at that point in time. Or if you'd rather, you can write your question in the chat box and we will address them that way. So without further ado, uh, Michelle, I hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Nicole. That was a great introduction. Um, thanks so much for having me today. Um, my name is Michelle. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm a, a startup lawyer. Um, and I also work with some bigger companies. Um, I, I've been doing this for almost 10 years now. And um, I've worked in China, London, San Francisco, Ontario, and um, New York, where I'm based now. Um, and I work with all different kinds of businesses. Um, I did my first degree in business. I love working with entrepreneurs. Um, I just love people who have great ideas and who want to make a difference and change how we do business or change how we access different products or services or, or even think about how we, how we live. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, it's a really positive um, field because in general, uh, there's a lot of creativity. So it's a lot of uh, deals, a lot of um, new ventures, a lot of new team members, and new a lot of there's a lot of newness and innovation, and, and that's what I really like. And I'm I'm guessing that's why what has drawn you guys to uh, this kind of work as well, because um, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a slog. Um, so thanks for coming out, and um, I I'm gonna go through uh, sort of the basics of corporate law um, uh, when it comes to uh, starting your own business. Um, I'll go through corporate structures, share structures, um, getting investor ready, types of, inv of investors and investments, and uh, what to look for uh, in terms of on a term sheet and uh, investor rights. So um, uh, I also work, I should say, I work for lawyersinhouse.com, and we are uh, a group of like-minded uh, lawyers who um, are interested in uh, different structures for providing legal services. Uh, and the main thing that we offer is, you know, high, besides high quality and years of experience is uh, a more flexibility in terms of um, how you interact with a lawyer. So we're not a big law firm. We don't have a giant office downtown Toronto, um, but we, uh, we offer that level of um, expertise and experience. So I'm really um, happy to be working with them and representing them today. Um, I'll also, I, you know, I recognize that it's not so interesting to listen to one person speak for an hour or so, so um, feel free to shoot over questions. Um, I'll be glancing at the chat uh, window and uh, I'll pause for, um, for questions as they come up. Okay, so uh, just getting started. Um, so you've You've got a new business idea. That's awesome. It's a new product. It's maybe it's a new um, a new kind of software, or maybe a new kind of um, application of software. That's amazing. You've, you've talked to some people um, who want to do it with you, and you know you're ready to go. So, uh, what do you do? Well, um, one of the first things you need to think about is like what what you're going to be. So, corporate structure is is sort of like the you know, it's, it's, it's the first thing to be thinking about. So 
if you are on your own and you're offering maybe graphic design or um, some kind of special service um, like development, maybe you want to be a sole proprietorship. And that means that there's really no uh, separation between you and your business um, in terms of um, um, liability and um, and uh, like uh, you know your your expenses and your taxes are the same as the business's expenses and taxes. So um, if you you know if you're sort of just doing uh, flexible work for the first time or you you're a freelancer for the first time, this might be something that you would start off as. Um, if you want to work with a partner, someone often someone who is sort of doing the same thing you are doing. So if you know, I'm a lawyer and I want to work with another lawyer. A partnership is something else to uh, consider. And that um, that creates uh, a more shared liability and shared um, um, uh, uh, shared identity in, uh, in terms of uh, a business. Um, but if you want uh, more separation between yourself and your business, you're likely that uh, going to incorporate. And um, that means that there's uh, there's the, the corporation, the business, and then there's you. And anything that the corporation does is separate from what you do and your expenses and your um, tax liability. So um, this is the probably the most uh, common structure that you're going to be um, faced with. Um, uh, in general, in Canada, 25% of directors have to be Canadian, except in uh, uh, a, a certain provinces listed here. Um, and you might have even come across this term, um, Canadian Controlled Private Corporation, um, which uh, is a, a corporation incorporated in Canada that is majority controlled by um, Canadian Canadians. So, um, you know, this gives you a bunch of different uh, benefits. You get a lower tax rate, some tax credits. Um, if you're doing special R&D, um, there is a, a shareholder capital gains ex exemption on the first 750k of um, of, uh, of, uh, of your capital gains, um, and uh, when you issue employee stock options and they are exercised, there's no taxable um, event until uh, those shares are sold. So we'll get well maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. But these are the basic kinds of uh, structures, um, but. Um, and, you know, most likely most startups, they want to incorporate because they want this, they want to be a big tech, tech company, they want to change the world, they want to do good things and um, be part of the future. So um, we're moving on once you've uh, created uh, a corporation or uh, another kind of business structure, uh, what do you do? Well, um, one thing you, you need to do is to consider the kinds of um, shares you want to issue. So how is the ownership going to work? Um, and so there's different kinds of uh, uh, shares. Um, there's common shares um, and preferred shares. And common shares are um, normally what you issue to founders. Um, so if you have some co-founders, normally you would all have uh, founder stock um, for in exchange for, normally it's uh, sweat equity, so your, your effort. Uh, in putting together the, the business and, and building a product or service. Um, you often, uh, friends and family are, are issued common shares. You know, they're the first, the people who know you, the people who believe in you. Um, and they're, they're, they're normally, you know, there to support you, not necessarily, um, you, know, uh, you know, use you as a, a source of investment. Although that is something that you, you, that is often relevant. We can get into that later. Um, and these kinds of shares often have um, something called vesting attached to them, which means that um, the shares don't um, transfer to you, uh, to, uh, they're, they're not owned by you um, until certain vesting events happen. So um, normally uh, the, the structure is four years of investing with something called a one-year cliff. So it means you need to stay with the company for at least one year to be um, eligible for the vesting, and then you need to stay for another uh, three years after that to um, uh, uh, to, to uh, acquire all the rest of the shares that were issued to you. So it's usually 25% each year. Or there can be something like milestone vesting where if you achieve a certain um, level of uh, growth or 
you develop uh, certain aspects of the product um, at certain stages, then uh, your shares can also invest there. Um, so those are uh, common shares and those are normally um, issued to you know, your core team. Um, so uh, moving on to preferred shares, uh, shares that um, differ from common shares in that uh, they're often non-voting and um, you know, as, as they're called, they're called preferred shares, they're, they have priority attached to them when it comes to um, paying out dividends or um, payout on any kind of liquidation event. So if, if, you know, if the company doesn't work out and you have to liquidate and sell off your assets, then preferred shareholders um, get paid first. Um, so uh, we'll get into that a bit more when we talk about investor rights, but normally the kinds of people who um, would be interested in preferred shares are you know, this kind of investor, um, sophisticated investors who want to make uh, an, a, a large profit on your, on your, um, your business idea. And, and moving on, um, there's um, something else that you might've heard of, uh, stock options. And so options are the, um, are, 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 um, are uh, the option, it, it provides you an option to buy shares at a future date. So um, you don't have to uh, exercise your option, but you get, you know, you having the option gives you that, gives you that ability. So, um, these are most often seen when it comes to an employee stock option pool. Um, uh, normally when you set up a company, it's advisable to set aside a certain amount of equity, normally 10 to 20% um, for an employee stock option pool because if you have a great idea, you're probably gonna need great team members and to have you know, the, you know, great talent and to be competitive, you, you often need to to give them um, a really good uh, incentive package. And that, that often includes uh, employee stock options. Um, another uh, group of people who are often issued stock options are advisors. Um, you know, they, they often you know, are given a choice whether they want what kind of, um, what kind of equity they want, but you know, one of the choices is usually stock options. Um, and uh, again, stock options often include uh, vesting uh, provisions. So uh, as a way to, you know, it's normally, it's, it's an incentive tool um, uh, and benefits. So as a way to um, incentivize your team and your advisors, um, you know, uh, the, uh, vesting conditions like number of years um, of work with the company or milestones reached uh, are attached to these kinds of share structures because you might need a really big team one day. And so you're gonna need a way to um, uh, incentivize them without necessarily uh, always uh, be, uh, you know, paying them in cash. Okay, so getting investor ready. Um, so uh, basically well, you've got a great idea, uh, you've got a team uh, and um, you're ready to go. So uh, we go, go through the steps that we've sort of gone through um, you incorporate, um, maybe you, you know, you have, you put together a founder agreement with, the, with your co-founders. Um, so you decide on how, who's going to do what and, and who, wh uh, who's going to share in the company, you know, at what level, what percentage is each, um, is each co-founder going to receive uh, and you issue shares. Um, you, you know, you'd often need to have uh, contracts in place for anyone you want to work with, whether they're um, an independent contractor or if they're an employee or if they're an advisor or if they're a consultant. So um, you need to have that all papered. Um, uh, paperwork that, uh, that go with your product or service like sales or SaaS agreements, um, subscription agreements. Um, uh, these are customer either uh, user and uh, end user uh, agreements, or uh, you know, there, it's a B two B business and uh, uh, sort of a master services agreement or master sales agreement. Um, and uh, then you need to also think about protecting your intellectual property. Um, you know, that could just be your name, so just a way to be distinctive in the marketplace. Um, you might want to trademark your 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 business name, um, or if you've um, developed uh, um, art or design around your name or your your the your brand, 
um, that's also think, uh, something that you can protect. Or you know, if it's if it's software, there could be code. Or you know, there's a lot of um, different kinds of uh, IP that you could be creating that you need to protect, and that all needs to be um, documented so that uh, investors know um, that when they're investing in you, that they're also um, investing in your intellectual property, and that's something that you're you're protecting. Uh, once you've done all that, uh, everything, all your paperwork is nicely put together, um, and you know you you know you can think about different ways of uh, keeping all your documents organized so that you can easily just show investors um, who you are. Um, I'm a company. I exist. Uh, all these deals exist. Um, then you can think about uh, uh, putting together a cap table, uh, and that's just um, you know a, a snapshot of who owns what in the company. So you can do this very easily um, on Excel, or there's a lot of different kinds of software you could use. Um, and this is sort of the beginning uh, document that you'll you'll use to um, uh, to manage the ownership of your company. And investors um, are uh, are very interested in this document because they want to see how much they uh, would own in the company in different stages, and they also want to know who else owns um, a part of your company. Is it your is it your friends? Is it your family? Are there other investors that they know or that they don't know? Uh, is it your employees who have been issued uh, stock options? They just want to see everything in one place. Um, so that's the cap table. And then finally, um, once you've done all that work, uh, um, you can start thinking about um, uh, the term sheet. And so this is a, you know, it's a document that um, sets out the basic terms that of uh, the investment, um, you know, the amount, uh, that sort of thing. And um, it'll be sort of your first point of uh, negotiations for any kind of investor. So there's all different kinds of investors. Um, there are, you know, sophisticated uh, ones, there's unsophisticated ones, there's ones you know, there's ones you don't know. Um, we can go through a couple uh, here. Um, you yourself, as a founder, you are an investor. Um, you might be putting in um, some of your own own capital into the, into the company, and that also makes you an investor. Um, your, you know, your initial advisors, um, maybe your professor at university or you know someone you met at work who has a lot of expertise in the area that you're going into um, you know they could also be uh, in, uh, uh, investing in you um, there are incubators and accelerators um, that um, not only provide great programs where you can access uh, expertise and workshops and advice on um, on sort of basics and how to run your Run your um, run your business. Um, often they will provide uh, space or a physical working space, or uh, or or uh, or finances um, for in exchange for a certain percentage of equity in your in your business. Um, in the last picture, if you watch Silicon Valley, he ran an accelerator out of his house, and he was. Uh, he would also own part of um, part of the startup uh, Pied Piper in, in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, also, friends and family. Um, and we've just discussed before people who really believe in you, people who really believe in your idea, um, want to help you out at this early stage. Um, they're a type of investor. Um, and uh, I should say that um, investors generally are also. Um, classified in two different kinds of categories. They're either accredited or non-accredited, um, or um, they fall into a kind of exemption, like a friends and family exemption. And that, that that's just a distinction in securities law where um, you know that's in place to protect investors so that if you're not very sophisticated, um, but you want to invest in someone that, you know, there's provisions there that that protect you. So uh, if you're if you're going to be taking those kinds of investments, um, in any kind of investment, you, you'll you'll need to sign off, uh, or the investor will need to sign off on uh, understanding the risks, um, whether on the basis of you know their sophistication um, as an accredited investor or the fact that they know you. Um, um, so so that is something that would usually be involved in the paperwork. 
Um, another kind of investor that a lot of people heard of, angel investors. Um, these are normally um, uh, experienced uh, investors or people who are in the industry who, um, who want to make small investments um, in things that they believe in and they often uh, carry with that a lot of expertise and advice. Um, they are, they're normally, um, they could normally also be investing as a group. So like one, one guy gets a bunch of friends together and they all really like your idea and they create something called a special purpose vehicle. And as, as, a, as a group, as a syndicate, um, they will all invest in you. So you'll have, you know, maybe five people all putting in 10, 10K as, and the, you know, that'll be, that'll be a syndicate. Um, and then finally, the most common uh, investor that uh, people often hear about is venture capital. And these are, um, these are funds that are put uh, together that pool a lot of different kinds of money together um, from uh, limited partners. Um, and they make, uh, you know, they make investment choices on behalf of other people. Um, and they're looking normally for, um, for, for high returns. They're looking uh, solely at, um, you know, for, I mean, for the majority, they're looking at getting a return on your idea in a certain amount of time. Um, so uh, what are the kinds of investments that uh, the, these kinds of investors um, are looking, usually uh, look to, um, look to, to, to make a deal with, um, with you. Um, these, so uh, restricted stock is um, something that founders uh, and team members normally are issued. Uh, and that's just stock that has a restriction attached to it. And that normally that's uh, a, vesting, uh, a vesting clause uh, as I discussed before. Uh, when your company first issues um, shares, uh, you often are, you know, you're providing a share subscription to whoever is buying those shares. Um, and you know it, that has its own form of agreement. Um, if you're a founder, your advisor is, um, is is giving you advice, but they're also getting uh, something, some equity in return. That's normally done through a fast agreement. Um, now, what's really common is a, something called a simple agreement for future equity, and that or safe agreement, and that is uh, a straightforward uh, document that sets out you know, valuation uh, cap, maybe a discount on the valuation cap uh, and um, the term that sets out that at a future, at a future financing event, event um, that, that investors uh, uh, in, uh, funds get converted into equity um, at the valuation and discount cap that you negotiate. Um, something, and that's a, that's a convertible um, security. Um, something that's also similar, it's also convertible, is a convertible note. And that's um, similar to the safe, um, except it also includes uh, a repayment clause. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's different from the safe in that it also includes like a, a, a debt um, aspect. So uh, if, and, and, and an interest rate um, attached to it. So there may be, you know, there may be extra requirements from the investor that that they would want to um, be repaid in certain circumstances or that they may choose to be repaid in certain circumstances. So if you're entering into a convertible note, uh, it's, it's important to be aware that, um, that maybe you have those discussions and you may, maybe look closely into the wording of the agreement to make sure or to understand uh, what your obligations are. Um, because, you know, investors, often want equity but and they will say that they want equity um so you know that's the intention going in um you need to ensure that the agreement itself um reflects that um and then finally a simple share purchase is is a is a transaction where uh one person could be a third party um someone not involved in the business uh buy shares um from uh from someone who already has shares. So it could be in a future financing round that, um, uh, you, you know, people who are, you know, if you have friends and family who are holding shares and 
you know, they want to cash out uh, and you're getting a big investment from a VC fund, um, uh, they, they would, um, uh, you know, they could have the option of selling to the company or selling to uh, a third party. Um, so that would be in the form of a share purchase agreement. Okay, so. Okay, I'm seeing a question. Um, I'm just gonna pause um, on that and, and read this question. So um, this is from Ian and they're asking if there are legal parameters that need to be met when defining valuation, how you came to the value before your investors buy in. So um, Ian, uh, there aren't really any legal parameters that need to be met. Um, I mean, you can define, in, when it comes to defining valuation, you can uh, insert your own parameters, um, but I mean, that varies. So it could be fair market valuation. So in, you know, that could be done by an independent auditor or um, an, an expert in your field who, could, who has the requisite knowledge to understand what the fair market value would be. Um, or it could just be, you know, whatever is also happening in your industry um, with other startups. You know, you could use benchmarks to, to see what your valuation should be. There's, you know, it, it's, it, it is often sort of on the part of the investor to, uh, to determine the valuation um, themselves, uh, and you, you know, as as a as a startup, you know, you can also use different accounting methods. You can use a net present value method where you like look at all your profits over time, and then you can calculate how much you'll be worth now versus how much it could be at a future time. You know, but you know that's that's maybe the most accurate. But you know, there's no set way in how to determine valuation. It can, it's there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, I should say that um, that you know at different investment rounds. So uh, if an angel investor um, sets a valuation uh, that's too high or, or that's higher than what it is at a later later round, um, you know that that changes um, what what their uh, investment. And in the in the past round would end up being so because in in convertible rounds there's no you're not actually issuing shares right away you're not issuing equity right away um, you know it's kind of everyone's best guess uh, and that's where the discount helps a little bit because uh, it gives you some wiggle room around what the future valuation will be um, that's also something that you can negotiate um, if you want to give depending on you know who you're talking to. But yeah, very good question. Very difficult thing to um, to determine. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Okay, so um, moving on. Um, so now you've you've talked to your investors, um, and now you've got a document of some um, terms um, um, to go through, and uh, you know this is called a term sheet. So these are the kinds of things that it would set out. It would set out um, the amount of the investment, um, valuation cap, um, which I just discussed, um, a discount rate, uh, and you know, with these um, metrics, uh, you you can calculate the price per share and the percentage of equity that they would end up with. Uh, but those those things may or may not be on the term sheet. Um, but uh, with the you know those three you know, those five different terms, um, you can, are all part of the same formula. You can calculate uh, a single one you, if you have the other ones. Um, another thing that a, a term sheet would have that what will also be part of your negotiations will be uh, investor rights. So these are uh, rights that are attached to their shares, um, which I'll go into in a bit. Um, they'll also in, uh, include some founder requirements. So uh, investors often wanna see that uh, Founders have been issued stock and that founders have uh, assigned their intellectual property to the company. So, um, so that, um, you know, the investor knows that if they're investing in the company, um, the founder leaves, you know, the, the company still has IP. 
uh, and this will, and another thing that 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 investors will also look for um, is vesting. Uh, you know, are you going to stick around? So vesting uh, a vesting agreement or vesting clause of your um, your restricted stock agreement um, tells the investor that you're going to stick around for at least you know some time, um, so that they know that you, you know you know that the person that they're talking to, the person they're investing in, the tomb they're investing in, are going to be doing what they say they're going to do. Um, and then, you know, if you are if you are dealing with any kind of convertible, like a safe, or she will include interest rate. So um, that'll be the interest on on the um, on the note if there's going to be a payback uh, or if if you're going to be repaying them. Um, a maturity date, which is the amount of time um, the amount of time that will go by before uh, a convertible could potentially be repaid or convert, converted into equity, and also a um, liquidity payout. So if in the case that uh, you know, it doesn't work out and you need to close the company, um, uh, how are you going to be able to repay this person? Um, and th there, there's all different ways you can negotiate that. So um, uh, looking a bit more deeply into investor rights, um, the most common one that people uh, bring up um, will be pro rata or preemptive rights. And this is uh, simply the rights to maintain your equity share or percentage, um, no matter uh, what happens in the future. So if there is another, just say you have 5% as an, as an angel investor, if in the future there's uh, a bigger angel investor who comes around or a, a bigger financing round that comes up, or maybe a VC fund, um, that you have the right to um, uh, participate in the in the future round so that you can keep your percentage share. So um, so you can maintain that five percent. That's usually an optional um, an option of the investor, but you know it's their it's their right so that they don't get uh, diluted down. Um, information rights are uh, just the right to be able to inspect your uh, financial documents and normally. That can be on a you know monthly, quarterly, or annual basis, depending on what you agree. Um, that can also involve include the right to sort of inspect your your office. Um, uh, that's not so common, but um, you know, maybe depending if you're if you're doing something that involves manufacturing, maybe that, that that's relevant. Um, a board seat. Uh, uh, you know that you'll you'll have directors um, when you register. That that's often the founders. Um, sometimes um, an investor also wants to be a director so that they can uh, have voting rights and have a say in, uh, in sort of the, the larger operational um, decisions of the business. Or if they don't want a board seat, they can often ask for observer rights. So an observer right simply is um, the ability to, to sit in board meetings of the founders or the directors and to uh, observe um, observe the, the um, what happens in the meeting. So that can also be, you know, something to think about because, you know, there, there'll be someone physically there when you're discussing, you know, important, um, important things that are happening in your business. Um, and then finally, um, rights on conversion. So um, some people will ask for a certain, um, you know, maybe the right to convert at all. So that's called voluntary conversion. Um, so if, you know, if at any time someone, someone, an investor wants to convert their, um, their, the funds that they put in into equity, then they can, or um, otherwise, uh, if, if that's not in there, then, you know, there's, there's an automatic conversion time. But some people like to have um, the voluntary conversion in there in case, you know, there's not a future financing round um, or, you know, if, you know, something else, you know, yeah, mainly, mainly if there's not a future financing round or, or there's something, there's something that hasn't triggered um, the company into, into converting. So there, there was an interesting case, uh, someone, or interesting example, someone brought to me of, um, of a company that had, the founder had, um, did not have voluntary conversion rights in their all their um, uh, financing documents. And so 
they never did a financing round after the first one. And so after, you know, the company went to IPO and at, at that, you know, the, the founder argued that no one actually had shares in the company besides him because a conversion event never happened. And, you know, he was, he was right. And everyone was very, very pissed off. Um, I'm trying to think of the name. I think it's something like, I'll, I'll look up the name in a bit, but um, that can happen. Um, so conversion is something that's important. Okay. So um, that's my presentation today. Um, um, let me know if there's any questions. Uh, I think we have some time um, just to open it up for some questions. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. That was that was a lot of information, <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good. I mean, it's all necessary and uh, um, so appreciated so much. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the floor is now open to anybody who has any questions. Uh, if you would like to write your question in the chat, you can very, very much do so. If you would like to ask your question in person, then feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask Michelle your question. So we'll just, we'll wait and see uh, what comes of it. If not, I have a few here that I can ask myself. So I am seeing this, this another question in a chat um, from Ian. Uh, who's asking that, um, you know, in general, as long as the founder retains 51% of shareholding, they can do anything. Um, are there any restrictions? So, um, so in Canada, normally, uh, a lot of um, board decisions need to be done with a, a two thirds majority. So, um, uh, you know, that would be 66%. So, um, you know, you would need maybe one other one other person who has 25 percent you know you would you wouldn't be able to make decisions on your own um because you need to make uh meet that 66 percent threshold okay we have a question here from uh tim at panda pay uh the question is michelle on a new startup do you help guide how the share structures can be set up or should be set up based on the industry or is it standard? Yeah, so, um, you know, when, when, when a startup comes to us and they're, they're looking to incorporate, you know, something we'll talk about will be sort of their plans for um, investment in the future and, or, or ownership in the future. So, you know, that is absolutely something that we'll help guide them on. Um, there are, you know, there are standards and we'd also sort of share what the standards would be, um, you know, but it, in general, you know, uh, you know, we would work with the, the startup to sort of figure out what's best for them. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, I, I while people are thinking, I do, I've jotted down a, a couple of here. Um, and uh, something as simple as when, when do you know when it's time to incorporate? If you're a sole proprietor, um, and you know, you feel it's time to make that, or you want to make that leap. How do you know when the right time is? Well, uh, that can be different for different people. Um, I, I mean, it, it depends on, um, your personal situation, um, as a founder, are you still working? Um, are you allowed to do other work outside your primary job? Um, that's some, firstly something to think about, or, you know, are you prepared to, if not, are you prepared to quit your job and start working just on your startup? Um, so, you know, you get, you, I think you have a little bit of leeway if you, if, if you're, if you have a, a job that restricts you from, from working outside of your job um, to just sort of think about the idea uh, for a bit, but when, when you actually want to dive in and work on it and incorporate, then you need to think about, you know, are you ready to, to leave your primary place of employment? Um, if, if your job is, is uh, okay with you having a side hustle, then I would say that the main, or you're not, you don't have a, jo a job or, you know, you're, you're taking some time off just to work on your, um, your, your startup idea, which is great. Um, uh, I think once you want to start um, transacting or, or working with uh, others um, for your business, then that would be a good time to incorporate. Um, 
So, you know, it's a very simple process. Um, it, it doesn't take too long. Um, and you don't, you, you know, you can also set your accounting period so that, you know, gives you some time to think about how you're going to manage your day-to-day -day accounting and how you're going to, how you're going to report that at the end of the year. Um, but um, yeah, if you want to be doing, if you want to be hiring people, if you want to be putting together uh, a website, you know, you, you'd have to be paying for your fees. Um, yeah, I think that would be probably a good time to incorporate when you actually want to start acting. Okay. That's, that's very cool. That's very different than, uh, you get so many different answers to the same question. It's great. So my, so here's, here's a question. Um, a, a person could be looking at, uh, you know, do I actually become actually become uh, for profit or non profit, and the the advantages disadvantages to that because both can look very similar in regards to structure and yet very different. And do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, they're they're definitely very different. Um, you know, registering a company is much more straightforward and simpler than registering a nonprofit. Um, with a nonprofit, there's a lot more administrative requirements um, because uh, you know, nonprofits must have a charitable purpose. Um, and they, you know, they are also tax exempt. Um, so you know, um, the CRA and you know, the comp you know, in Industry Canada take that very seriously. So you need to be able to meet those requirements uh, of having a charitable purpose. Um, so if you're if you're looking to if you're looking to make a profit if you're looking to maybe selling something and growing your business um, and you know maybe it could be in you know something in an area that has a social impact um, but you know you, you you want to grow you want to operate and look like a, a business um, you know nonprofit is probably not for you um, but if you're looking for something that's uh, that's solely for a charitable purpose. Um, you know, it, it could be education or the arts or, um, in, you know, in health. Um, you know, th there's a whole list of uh, potential charitable purposes, um, and you want to sustain the organization with um, with grants or with or with donations. Um, then you know, maybe a nonprofit structure is more suitable for you. But I, I think like this day and age, so, so many, I mean, that's a very particular kind of structure. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very different mentality to be working for a nonprofit. Whereas, you know, in the corporate or in the startup realm, I'm seeing a lot more people who wanna make a social impact. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't do it if they're a business, of course they can do it. Um, there's different um, accounting practices they can use that are really um, well recognized in the industry where you, you have like a triple bottom line and it's a different way of reporting and um, um, taking metrics on, you know, what your business is doing. Is it having an environmental people and community uh, impact? And there's also investors who are um, set up to invest in social impact organizations. So, you know, you know a lot of people now are, are looking at uh, anything in, in, uh, involving the climate and sustainability, you know, this is healthcare, this is really important for us right now. Um, investors want to make a difference too, so they'll look for um, founders who have ideas that are going to be shaking things up in those in areas. Uh, and, you know, that's really in terms of your mission, your product, and how you tell that story. But you can also register as a, as a B Corp, as like a, it's like the, the one certification you can get as, to be sort of understood as a social enterprise so you have a certain kind of environmental or human impact that that has a certain you know this that that, that meets their standard so um a lot of different ways to make a social impact um if that's what you want to do um so so yeah come talk to us if you have those kinds of ideas <laughs> uh, that's great. Now, before I, I move on, I'm just going to look and see and ask if anybody has any questions um, that are still here on the call with us. Okay, feel free to unmute. Okay, well, I'm just going to keep going then. Um, so you, you brought up and you mentioned that one word social enterprise. 
And so um, for a new person who's, uh, you know, getting into this entrepreneurial world and this whole idea, it almost sounds like there's, there's three options, nonprofit, uh, profit, and a social enterprise, but that's actually not true, correct? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, a social enterprise is, 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 I guess, a term of art. It's not necessarily a legal category of um, entity, um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's something I, I, I work with. I mean, I work with a lot of social enterprises because a lot of people seem to have social impact uh, involved in their business um, plan. So, you know, generally it's a business, it's a for-profit business that has a social, a social side to it. Um, and that could be, you know, in any of the, the areas that we mentioned or, or new areas that we haven't even thought about. Um, but, you know, generally environmental people, um, diversity, um, health, you know, and education, those kinds of um, areas. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, <laughs> because, yes, I will confess, I was one of those people that was thinking there's a third option. <laughs> I like this social enterprise option, but it's not a real option in the sense of legally. Well, it, can, it can be, I mean, a lot of people can classify themselves as a social enterprise. I mean, Spark Niagara, you know, could be one, you, you know, co-working spaces in general or shared workspaces in general, they're, they're disrupting the way that people work together and not in traditional offices, um, you know, in open spaces where they can um, collide and make and have ideas and that, you know, innovation and having great ideas and bringing people together, is, you know, definitely it's a, a social, uh, social impact, there's social impact there. So yeah, um, even Spark Niagara could be considered a social enterprise if they want to make that part of their identity. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so here's here's another question. So for somebody who is uh, looking at, you know, either, you know, becoming incorporated, or whatever, at which point is it necessary for, to have lawyer involvement? Because I know it's going to be necessary at some point, but how much can can a person get done ahead of time before bringing in a lawyer? Well, I actually was thinking of asking the group um, sort of a question along those lines. Is, does anyone here, is everyone here incorporated? Or, I mean, how many people are incorporated right now? Nobody? So, so everyone here is thinking about incorporate. Oh, Ian is, okay, nice. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> uh okay okay that's really interesting um and Ian, have you spoken to a lawyer or how did you do your incorporation yourself lawyer yeah so i mean it could it can be at any stage um you can incorporate yourself um especially if you want to um do it federally it's very easy you go on the industry canada website um you know should take shouldn't shouldn't take too long um and you can always you know, if you didn't, if you didn't do it right the first time, when you speak to a lawyer, they can always help you fix it. Um, so there's a great service called founded.co that I think it's like $600 and they, and they do the incorporation for you. Uh, and a lot of the, the general company secretary um, aspects of incorporation. Um, so, oh, but you know, if, if you're really, I don't know, I, I think speaking to a lawyer, you know, it has many benefits and, you know, one of the benefits is time, you know, are you spending all your time working with your developers and creating a new product and trying to do a part-time job and maybe you have a family or maybe you're doing classes and, you know, maybe you're doing a hundred million different things. Maybe you want someone to help you do one of those hundred million things. And yes, actually that's, it's very helpful <laughs> to speak to a lawyer. Um, but you know a lot of the information that I that especially that I'm going through today, it, it's all available on the internet. Um, there's a lot of services online that you could find that are free or that are not very expensive that you can that can help you uh, at a really early stage. Um, but when things get a little bit more complicated, especially if you're when you're oh, we froze. Hello. You froze. Hi, you froze for a minute there, Michelle. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's, <laughs> that's technology. That's got nothing to do with you. <laughs> oh yes, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. Maybe I'll stop. So should I stop sharing my screen? Stop sure. Sharing. Okay. There we go. 
Okay. Oh yeah, definitely. Ian also adds, um, oh, he needs, okay. Yeah, it, it also depends on um, what your what your cash situation is like. Um, you know, are you willing to do, are you ready for, for spending a little bit on, on legal, on lawyers? Um, and, and yes, also, if you want to protect your IP, it is important to get legal advice. Um, but sometimes also talking to a lawyer is helpful if you want to know how much you need to spend, because they will tell you, and they'll give you different options of what's out there. And, you know, they, there's a range of kinds of services, a range of different kinds of lawyers. Um, so it's, it's good to sort of understand what the market is, um, because, you know, if you have a great idea, then you're going to need one eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't disagree on that whatsoever. Okay, so uh, we are almost at the end of our time here. Does anybody else have any questions uh, that, that you would like to ask? Um, now, I do know that um, if uh, you have a question after the fact, that you can definitely reach out to uh, lawyersandhouse.com um, and we can put that in for Greg, Greg, if you want to write that for everybody, that would be great. Sure, we will do. Absolutely. Yeah. Nicole. Thank you. Uh, folks can reach out to me and then I can, depending on which uh, area of law and so on, then I can get our specific lawyers engaged. Okay. Why don't you introduce yourself then? <laughs> I'll get off mute. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Greg Swift. I'm the uh, CEO at Lawyers and House. So um, certainly if there's any questions around, I, hopefully a lot of the folks uh, we're on our initial call, which was Law 101, but if there's any questions, obviously, around corporate, uh, employment, commercial, et cetera, then I'll, uh, I'll share my uh, email in the uh, chat box, and folks can reach out to me, and then I can, uh, I can deflect to the right lawyers in our organization. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for, Thanks, for chiming in there. appreciate that very much. And... Um, Michelle has uh, kindly put her direct email there. If you'd like to uh, reach out to her, you can do that, or you can uh, check out the uh, lawyersandhouse.com and uh, see all the plethora of services they're able to provide you with, which is amazing. So unless there's another question, I think we're at the end of our time here today. So I want to thank you, Michelle, so much for uh, being so open, being so thorough, being so clear, and so willing to, um, you know, share all of this knowledge. This is, this is not easy stuff to, to share, and it's not easy stuff to understand, and yet you made it, you made it uh, so, much, so much easier. <laughs> so I appreciate that so much. And uh, thank all of you for joining us today. And uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't yet, to uh, see the webinar that we had a few, I think it was a few months ago uh, with Lawyers in House. And that was with um, Christine Holmes, who is the founder and CEO. And uh, she did just Law Basics 101. It was great. Uh, to just jump off of um, some of the uh, things that Michelle was sharing, there is another webinar that you can find that will talk about the different types of investors that exist, you know, you know, the angels and the capital investors, and there's all a bunch of others as well that uh, we got into a little bit deeper uh, again a few months ago. I think it was in October, September, October. So I'd encourage you to do that. You can do that on our YouTube channel. This will be based on our YouTube channel as well. And next week we have our final a webinar for 2020. Uh, so I would encourage you to check it all out. It's all talking about protecting you, which is your greatest asset, of course. And uh, this Friday, so tomorrow is our Fika Friday. What the heck is that? That's an online coffee time. If you go to our website, you can register and join us. We just sit around talking, having coffee, going to breakout rooms and just really hang out. So, uh, you know, it's a great networking opportunity. Great time to talk with like-minded people. Thank you again, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. Hope you have a great day. If we don't see you, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Thank you.